Well, please have a seat. Now, people are already suggesting, aren't they, that you know, we'll look back and divide history into BC, before COVID, and AC, after COVID. You know, this year is going to have a huge impact, isn't it, on our world? And, and maybe people are starting to think, what kind of world are we now entering into? And that's a question for us here, isn't it, at Sunbridge Road Mission? What kind of church will we be after COVID? And we've already spoken a bit about how COVID has, has stripped everything back. And obviously there's been huge loss in that. But there's also an opportunity, isn't there, for us to think together about how we want to rebuild as a church. And these next eight weeks, as, as Lucas mentioned, um, we're starting um, an SRM Vision and Value series. So six of those sessions are going to be thinking about values. What does it mean to be part of Sunbridge Road Mission? And maybe actually you're quite new to the church. Maybe you're connecting online. You haven't yet come down in person. You know, this, hopefully it will be helpful to see what it involves to be part of the family here. But before that, we're having two weeks looking at vision. And this really is a chance to look ahead. You know, where are we going as a church? What's important for us? What are we aiming at? What are we all about as a church? And we know, of course, don't we, that history is defined not by COVID, but by Christ. You know, the great division in human history is not BC, AC, but BC before Christ and AD, the year of our Lord. It's Jesus that defines the course of history. And it's Jesus who establishes the mission for his church. So the focus for this series is going to be those words of vision that Jesus speaks to us as his followers right at the end of Matthew's Gospel. And it's, it's fitting that we're hearing these words the week after Easter, isn't it? You know, the message we looked at last week for the women at the tomb to pass on to Jesus' disciples was twofold. He is risen, and he's going ahead of you into Galilee. And here, as we look at the end of Matthew's Gospel, we find the risen Jesus with his disciples in Galilee. And this is his vision for them as his disciples. But it's more than that, isn't it? It's his vision for us as his disciples. It's his vision for us as his church. So let me read. This is Matthew 28, starting at verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Now there's four verbs here in Jesus' command. Go, make disciples, baptise and teach. But the main verb, the focus here, is make disciples. That's the heart of Jesus' vision. Now what is a disciple? You know, it's not a word we use much, is it, in the world today. A disciple is not simply a convert. You know, the, the, the language of disciple is far more active than that. A disciple is a follower. You know, Jesus' disciples literally walked with Jesus. They followed after him as he traveled around. So to be a disciple is to allow Jesus to direct our lives. A disciple is a learner. You know, again, Jesus' disciples sat under his teaching. To be a disciple is to allow Jesus to instruct us. Another word for a disciple is an apprentice. You know, again, think of Jesus' disciples. They were trained in his ways, weren't they? So to be a disciple is to allow Jesus to use us. Many of you will have heard the phrase, a dog is for life, not just for Christmas. And what's that doing? It's taking the emphasis away from a decision, isn't it? Onto a new way of life. And I think that's true with discipleship. It is far more than a decision. It's a way of living. And and Jesus' vision for his church is to make disciples. And then we get three verbs that are involved in that. Go, baptize, and teach. And baptism here shows it it does involve a decision, doesn't it? Discipleship is bigger than conversion. But without conversion, without the life of God at work within us, there's no discipleship. Actually, the, the life of discipleship always begins with repentance and faith. 
You know, it's not ultimately something we do for God. It's a gift from God. And that's how it begins. You know, go shows us that we can't just expect people to come to us. And again, the language of all nations is language of reaching out to all kinds of people, isn't it? Jesus' invitation is to all. But it's not over there. You know, we've got this third word, teach. You know, baptism is not the end of the process. It's really the beginning of the process. From there, we start to learn Christ, grow towards maturity. Do you see here how Jesus' vision isn't just for converts, is it? But for disciples, mature disciples. And, and this is Jesus' vision for his church, for those who are going to follow after him. So it's right, isn't it, that, that our vision at Sunbridge Road Mission is to play our part of that here in Bradford. So if, if we're going to put that in a statement, Sunbridge Road Mission is a church committed to making disciples of Jesus Christ here in Bradford. That's what we're all about as a church. Or let me put that another way in, in slightly different language. We long to see people from all kinds of backgrounds who are on fire for Jesus. You know, all kinds of backgrounds gets at that aspect of Jesus' vision, doesn't it, of all nations. But, but also, it's appropriate for us here in Bradford. Bradford's a diverse city, isn't it? with all kinds of people living here. And we don't want Sunbridge just to be a church for certain kinds of people. We're excited about seeing all kinds of people gathered together in Christ. And on fire for Jesus, uh, here represents that, that, that maturity in discipleship. It, you know, it, it talks about conversion, doesn't it? You know, the work of God's Spirit in someone's life, but also its language of living for him wholeheartedly and obeying all that he's commanded. Now, if, if that's our vision, and that's Jesus' vision, we see this is a, a vision about people, isn't it? Not programs. So some of you might have seen this picture. Uh, it's a picture from a book called The Trellis and the Vine. And they use this illustration to get the point. They say, when you've got a vine growing in the garden, you know, the vine is the thing, isn't it? That's, that's the, the thing that's important. That's the thing that you care about. The trellis is there to support the vine. You need a trellis. But the trellis is there in the background. And, and they say, look, it should be the same in the church. Sometimes you'll need structures and programs, but they're there to support people, aren't they? The end goal in the church isn't the programs, the structures. The end goal, as we look around, is one another. It's people growing to maturity in Christ. S similar, you know, this also, this vision is a vision about disciples, not just about numbers. You know, our vision has to be bigger, doesn't it, than the number of people in the building. Like Jesus, our longing isn't just for people to attend events. Our longing is for mature disciples, people who are living for him all over the city throughout the week. So listen you know, to what Paul says, because this isn't just Jesus' vision. This was the Apostle Paul's vision. This is what he says in Colossians. He is the one, that's, Jesus is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. You know, this is our vision, isn't it, as a church? To see people fully mature in the Lord Jesus. And if that's our vision as a church, you know, how do we measure success? Well, it's not just about how many people come, is it? It's not just about how smoothly something runs. The question that matters is, are we making disciples? Are people growing in their maturity, in their love of the Lord? Are they living for him in their lives? That's what's going to matter, isn't it, on the last day? That's what Jesus is interested in. So, so you know, if this is our vision, a vision that Jesus gives us, how are we going to do this? And this is talking here, I suppose, more about strategy. We'll do this by going deep in order to reach wide. Going deep in order to reach wide. So think of um, a bridge, and there's a picture of a bridge coming up. A bridge can only reach across a wide gap if it has deep foundations. You know, in order to reach wide, it has to go deep, doesn't it? And we will only be able to reach into difficult places with the gospel if we ourselves are deeply grounded in the Lord. And again, think of a bridge. You've got to go deep, haven't you? You've got to get those foundations in before you start going wide. And it's the same with Jesus. You know, think about what he did with his disciples. He invested deeply with them, didn't he? Before he starts sending them out. And so this week, we're going to focus on the first part of that. 
going deep. And next week, we're going to focus on the second part, reaching wide. What, what, do I, what do we mean by going deep? You know, if that sounds a, a bit vague, here are four aspects to make it more specific. We're talking about going deep with God, going deep in his word, going deep in his ways, and going deep with one another. So firstly, deep with God. And one of the most well-known verses in the Bible is John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now imagine someone who, who knows nothing about the Bible, you know, who's never heard these kind of verses, who, who comes up to you and says, look, so what, what's eternal life? Why is that such a big deal? Just think for a moment, and I'll give you a few seconds to really think about this. How would you answer? How would you define eternal life? What kinds of things would you include? Well, I don't know what you'd say in answer to that question. But do you know how Jesus defines eternal life? Listen to what he says in John 17, verse 3. He says, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus defines eternal life not, merely, not primarily as a place, not primarily as a load of cool stuff that we get to do or experience. He defines eternal life relationally. We can know the living God. That's what's so great about eternal life. And later on in John 17, Jesus prays for us. He, he prays for those who will believe in him. And listen to what he, he longs for for us. He says, I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Do you hear that? Jesus' desire for us is that we would know God. We would experience something of the love and the relationship with the Father that Jesus himself enjoys. That's what Jesus longs for us as a church, so surely that's got to be our first aim. And I think um, knowing God is a bit like going in the sea. You know, if you, if you go to the beach and the sea's ahead of you, so I remember someone saying this to me about the sea. They said, look, the sea is, is shallow enough for a child to enjoy, but it's deep enough for an elephant to swim in. You know, and, and knowing God is a bit like that, isn't it? You know, God in his mercy is a God who makes himself accessible. You know, so even a child, or for us as we begin as, as believers, we can know him in a real way. But we don't finish knowing God there, do we? You know, God is a God who's so big and rich and deep. You know, there's always more to explore of him. And as a church, we don't want to be a place that leaves people in the shallows. We want to be a place where people learn to swim. People learn to enjoy the waves. We want to be a community of people who know the Lord who enjoy him, who talk about him, who walk with him, who delight in him. I, I read once of a, a group of believers in a remote African village, and each morning people would get up and kind of sort of set off on their own little track into the bush to pray. And they could tell how each other were doing with the Lord by the state the path was in. And, and they'd come to one another and say, you know, brother, I, I've noticed your path is getting a bit overgrown. You know, it was a sign they weren't walking with the Lord. Well, we want to be a community of believers that's concerned about where each other are at with the Lord, who, who ask each other the question, what's God been doing in your, in your life this week? And what's more, we want to be people, don't we, who when that question comes our way, we've got something to say. Because we've been with the Lord day by day. I don't know if you remember, but just before we went into the first lockdown, so just over a year ago, we looked at the account of Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10. You know, Jesus arrives at their house. Uh, Martha's busy doing jobs while Mary is sat at Jesus' feet listening to what he's saying. And what is Jesus' verdict when Martha complains about her sister? Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better. And it will not be taken away from her. You know, somehow I think that this has been a very timely passage for us going into the pandemic. You know, historically, 
Sunbridge Road Mission has always been a very busy church, a very active church. But this year, much of that busyness has been stripped away, hasn't it? And in that, I know for, for many of us, there's been huge loss and pain and struggle. But at the same time, many of you have told me this year how you've grown closer to God. You've spent more time in his word. You've learned to pray. And, and as we begin to emerge from COVID, you know, the question on everyone's mind is, when does it all restart? But as a church, we don't want to lose what we've gained here, do we? The one thing that matters, being with God, needs to remain our first priority. And one implication from that might be, actually, as a church, we need to limit our programs and activities in some way. To leave space for people to walk with the Lord themselves. One illustration um, I found helpful to think about this is of an iceberg. You know, if you're on a ship going through the sea and you see an iceberg, this is what you see, isn't it? The bit that emerges from the water. But actually, that's not all that's going on. You know, if, you, if we see the next picture, actually the vast majority of an iceberg is under the water. It's unseen. And I think in a healthy church, it's a bit like an iceberg. So what, what's going on today, you know, the, the, the Sunday service, is the bit people see, isn't it? It's the bit above the water. But in a healthy church, there's all that going on during the week that people don't see in our own lives as we walk with each other, as we send a message to one another. And that means actually when we come on, on a Sunday and praise, that shouldn't be the only time we praise God that week, should it? You know, that should be the tip of the iceberg. But, but actually, there should be all that praise that's gone on during the week. That's a healthy church. It's the same with prayer, isn't it? When we come on a Sunday, we come to a prayer meeting. You know, it's not healthy if that's our prayer. That should, that should be the bit that people see. But, you know, during the week, we're spending time with the Lord. But the same with God's word. You know, that's what we're longing for. A church where actually there's all the unseen, where we go deep with God. So deep with God, deep in his word. And Sunridge Road Mission has always been known as a Bible teaching church. You know, whether that's the gospel preaching, whether that's the Bible classes, we're a church that takes God's word seriously. And long may that heritage continue. You know, the, the, um, the first sermon I preached um, when I uh, began as pastor here was um, looking at Psalm, Psalm 1. And Psalm 1 describes the, the blessed one, the happy life according to God. And um, if we just go to the picture, someone says, um, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Isn't that a beautiful image? A healthy and fruitful tree. But in Psalm 1, what is that life built upon? Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. You know, that, that blessed life is marked by a delight in God's word. A meditation, that's like a kind of chewing over of God's word. So just as that stream sustains and nourishes the tree, it's God's word that sustains and nourishes us as his disciples. So again, we, we want to be a church that unashamedly delights in God's word. That, that chews on it, you know, throughout the week. I think sometimes when people hear language like going deep into God's word, you know, we can make the mistake of thinking that's all about head knowledge. As if kind of, you know, on the day when Jesus returned, we're all going to have to sit down and take a Bible trivia quiz. But that, that's not what we're talking about, is it? We want to go deep into his word because it's through the Bible that God reveals himself to us. You know, it's through the Bible so often, isn't it, that God works out his purposes in our lives. So listen to how Paul puts it in, in 2 Timothy. He says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, that the whole Bible is God's word, which means all of it is useful. God has purposes to accomplish in our lives through his word. And we're equipped to serve him through the ministry of the word. So what, what will going deep in God's word look like for us as a church? Well, it will mean the public preaching, won't it? And, you know, primarily uh, the message on a Sunday isn't a motivational talk or an entertaining speech. It's a time to hear what God has to say through his word. 
So that means as a church, we will prioritize expositional preaching, that is, starting with a passage of the Bible and hearing what God has to say from it. You know, often that, I think, you know, we think the best way to do that is to work through books of the Bible so that we can let God send, set the agenda. You know, we don't just focus on those few passages we like. We really hear what he has to say to us. So, you know, that, that's what it will mean in part, won't it? To be deep in God's word. But it, it's much bigger than that. It will mean part of this vision is growth groups. You know, that actually together we can look in more detail at what God has to say. We can apply that into our lives. We can ask questions and look for ourselves. But it will mean personal devotions. This is the kind of bottom bit of the iceberg, isn't it? We want to be a church where all of us know God's word. All of us delight in it. All of us meditate upon it. So we want to continue to resource one another, to spend time in God's word day by day, to encourage each other to read God's word ourselves. But I think another aspect of what it's going to mean for us to go deep in God's word is to train people to teach. You know, so um, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, Paul says this to Timothy. He says, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. You know, how do we protect the gospel, Paul's saying? Well, we don't do it by kind of wrapping it up and, you know, and leaving it with just a few people. We protect it by sharing it and equipping others to share it. So one, of, one way for us to go deep in God's word as a church is to equip lots of people to handle and teach God's word themselves. You know, not just a few individuals, not just me, not just the pastors, but actually to have lots of us who are familiar with God's word, who can teach it to others. You know, so we think it's important actually as a church um, that we're equipping people. And that might mean some additional kind of seminars or, or day conferences. You know, equipping people to handle the Bible. Uh, maybe that's looking at a Bible overview and thinking about how the whole Bible fits together. Maybe that's looking in detail about different parts of the Bible whether it's poetry or apocalyptic literature, how do we get our heads around that? Maybe it's more practical teaching, you know, for growth group leaders about how to lead a Bible study in a small group, or, or pe people learning how to preach, or kids' church leaders, you know, how do we teach God's word to children? So we want to be a church that, that is deep with God, deep in God's word, deep in God's ways. That we don't just know God's word, but that, that we do it. There's a, there's a story that Jesus tells that's really been on my mind recently. Uh, many of you will be familiar with it. It's the story about the wise and the foolish builder. And we often read this from Matthew's account. Uh, but I want to read it from Luke's account to help us hear the point. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my word and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and lay the foundation on rock. When the flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it, because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. Do you see what Jesus' point is here? His words will only benefit us if we put them into practice. If they're just heard or even just understood, they won't ultimately help us. When hard times come, we'll still be found out. Jesus' words help us as we do them. And that brings us kind of back to where we began, doesn't it? You know, we're about making disciples, about actually following Jesus. Jesus didn't just command us to teach everything, did he? But to teach people to obey everything. And we want to be a church that learns to walk in Jesus' ways that doesn't just know about prayer, but learns to pray, that doesn't just study generosity, but becomes generous. And that's because Jesus' words are good ways. You know, this is an invitation, actually, to a, 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 the life that God has for us. You know, I think, again, often when we think about needs and when we think about things that need to change, we often are looking outside the church, aren't we, at the needs we need to address. But actually, as we look around, as we look within... We're full of needs, aren't we? There's, full of th there's loads of things in our lives that, that Jesus needs to work on. And, and so we, we want to be a church, actually, where we look at those things, where we learn to push on and become more like Christ together. And that will mean developing context for more practical teaching. You know, again, this might be sessions on Saturdays that people can opt into 
um, that look at things like marriage and parenting or leadership or money or work or social media. You know, we're actually able to get a bit more practical with one another. But it will also mean developing a culture of discipleship relationships. You know, again, how did Jesus form his disciples? Yes, he, he sits them down and teaches them, doesn't he? But he walks with them. He goes into situations with them. He lives with them. And actually, that's a culture we want within the church. And that might mean mentors. It might mean couples meeting together to talk about marriage. It might be people meeting up one-to-one, -one, like Lucas was talking about, walking together. Because we're only going to be able to start interacting with, with the kind of deeper issues in our lives, aren't we? If there's a depth to our relationships. You know, we're only going to be able to really address some of these things if we know one another. And that takes us on to the fourth aspect, going deep with one another. So just, just listen to how Paul describes his ministry among the Thessalonians. He says, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God. It's so relational, isn't it? Mother, father, brother, sister, sharing life with them. And the New Testament describes the church as a family. You know, the most common way that believers are addressed is brothers and sisters. And in a healthy family, you know, those relationships are relationships of commitment and intimacy and security. You know, families should be the place where you can be real. You know, where you can be yourself with one another. And those are the kind of relationships we want within our church family. Not superficial, but deep. Not fake. You know, we don't want this to be a place where everyone has to come and pretend they're okay. But real. Where we can be honest about struggles with one another. Again, I think this is one of the most significant things God's been doing through this year in us as a, as a family. You know, a number of people have said one of the things that's been, you know, they've most treasured this year is how a culture of sharing honestly has grown up for us as a church. There's been, you know, lots of people have shared and, and given testimony, not just of great victories in their life, but also of how God has sustained them through struggle. You know, of how God has come alongside them in difficult times. And, and I've been so encouraged to see a growing vulnerability you know, that we're, we're prepared to share our weakness with one another, to be honest with one another about where we're really at. And we long for that to go on, don't we? You know, we long, again, we don't want that to be just a blip with the pandemic. We want that to be our culture as a church. But, you know, the reality is we can't all know one another deeply, can we? Even if you just look around this room, there's far too many people to, to know each deeply. And this is why growth groups are such an important part of our vision going forward as a church family. Because that's a context where you can really begin to get to know others deeply. You can be known by them. But there's other contexts, aren't there? You know, walking with others. Again, one of the highlights for me in this time has been walking with people. So often that's where things go a bit deeper. You know, so often it's as you share life with people, isn't it? That they go deeper. But it will mean hospitality too. Inviting people into our homes, into our lives. You know, Paul talked about sharing life with one another. Again, do you see, this is the, the bottom bit of the iceberg. If our relationships are just tea and coffee afterwards, as we go back to it, if our relationships are just the little bit of chat we have around a meeting, that's not depth, is it? You know, that, that should be the tip of the iceberg. But actually, what we're longing for is where there's all that other stuff going on throughout the week, where each of us actually know people, really, and are known by people. Jesus, you know, calls us to make disciples. <laughs> He calls us to teach people to obey everything he's commanded. And that's what we long for. We long to see people who are on fire for Jesus. And we want to be a church that goes deep. Deep with God, deep in his word, deep in his ways, and deep with one another. And it might be some of you are thinking, look, this all seems a bit introspective. But remember actually what this fits into. Going deep to reach wide. You know, and next week we'll be thinking about this other significant aspect of making disciples. Going. Going to people, all different kinds of people, that they might respond in repentance and faith, that they might begin to follow Jesus. But it's important to start with going deep. 
Because we're only going to share God with others if we know him ourselves. Anything we share of God flows out of our knowledge of him. We're only going to be able to stand distinctively in this society if we're anchored in the deep foundations of God's word. We're only going to be able to teach others to follow Jesus if we're following him in our lives. And how can we expect to go deep with people we don't yet know if we can't go deep with our brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you see, it's actually by going deep as a church that we'll be able to start reaching wide. Now, whose job is that? You know, I hope you're excited by that vision. Whose job is it? And it's tempting, isn't it, to say, right, Matthew, you've got some work to do. (laughs) Or to think, you know, the staff team had better get busy. But this is all of our job, isn't it? You know, we looked at Ephesians um, uh, in, in the autumn. And Ephesians 4 makes this really clear. I'm just going to read a few verses. Ephesians 4 says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So you see, I and the the other pastors have got a role actually in equipping you, all of us to serve and use our gifts. But you see, actually, this, this task of growing mature disciples is all of our work. Listen to how it goes on. Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. You see the vision? You know, and, and actually, if this is going to be our vision as a church, it can't just be my vision, can it? It can't even just be our vision as elders. This has to be our vision together. Because if we're going to go deep, we need each other's help. Let me just return to um, that image of of going in the sea. You know, as as a family, we love going to the sea. It's been a long time since we've we've been. And, you know, we're all at kind of different stages. You know, um, George is kind of just at that stage where he'll be paddling in the shallows, you know, and, and, and running away as the wave comes in. Henry's a bit further. You know, I, I might carry Henry out, um, and, and I don't think we'd get into the deep waves, but we might kind of get into, you know, waist deep or something like that. Lucy's at the stage where she'll be happy being out in the deep, but I'll need to keep hold of her. And John's just getting to that stage where, you know, you can kind of leave him alone in the waves as long as you're somewhere close by. You know, but, but we enjoy it. And, and, you know, every time we go to the sea, I'll take them out a bit deeper, a bit further. You know, I'll pick up Henry and I'll take him out into the waves, and they feel mixed about that, you know? There's, a, there's real excitement. They want to get in the waves. But there's also uncertainty. You know, they're uncomfortable. They're out of their comfort zone. But I'll keep going. Why do I do that? It's not because I'm mean. You know, it's not because I want them to kind of perform for me. It's because I long for them to enjoy the waves as I enjoy the waves. You know, I, I want to share that with them. I want to see them enjoying them. I know that once you've learned to enjoy the waves... You don't bother with the shallows anymore. You run through that pretty quick. And I think as we look at this idea of going deep, it maybe it's a bit similar for us. There's an excitement about that. You know, we, we want to go deep with God. We want to go deep in his word. We want to really follow him. We want to go deep with each other. But it's also uncomfortable, isn't it? You know, at times that won't be easy. Take, take this whole idea of vulnerability. We like it when someone comes up here and shares vulnerably and honestly about their struggles. But it's harder for us to do that, isn't it? It's harder for us to open up about things that are difficult. We like it when someone comes to us and says, could you help me? But we often find it harder to go to others for help in times of need. So we'll have to, you know, if we're going to go deep, it will take us outside our comfort zone. But again, why do I want to, you know, why do we want to push into that? Because this is what Jesus has for us, isn't it? And we we want to enjoy the waves. And actually, as we learn to go deep, as we trust him and keep pushing out, you know, once we've gone there, we we won't want to go back into the shallows. So, you know, I I trust this isn't just my idea. This isn't just our ideas as leadership. This is Jesus' heart and vision for us. That Sunbridge Road Mission is a church committed to making disciples of Jesus Christ here in Bradford. We, and I, by we there, I mean all of us. You know, so think and pray over this. Long to see people from all kinds of backgrounds who are on fire for Jesus. 
And we'll do this by going deep in order to reach wide. And just one kind of application to take from this. You know, if this is going to become our vision, we're going to need to think about it, aren't we? Um, so I encourage you, as you, you know, this afternoon, spend a bit of time and ask these two questions. If you're with other people, you know, discuss it with them. What are you excited about in this? In this idea of going deep, what excites you? And where do you feel the challenge? You know, where's the bit where it's going to be uncomfortable to press into? It'd be good, wouldn't it, for us to be talking about this together? Because it's a vision that we're going to need to own together as a church. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you for your grace to us. We know that discipleship doesn't start in our effort. It starts in your mercy. Lord, you have made it possible for us to know you and to follow you and to walk in your ways. And Lord, in your kindness, you invite us to follow you. And Lord, we long to be a church that is involved with the work that you're doing. What a privilege, Lord God, that you would involve us in the work you're doing in the world. And Lord, we pray particularly into this idea of going deep. Lord, again, we don't want to look back on our lives and think we never went deep with you. Lord, we never went deep with one another. We've missed opportunities there. Lord, we know that you are a good God. We know that ultimately what all this is about is knowing you. So teach us, Lord God. Thank you for the work you've been doing even this year. And in fact, thank you for the way in which, as things have been stripped away, for many, there has been a closeness with you. We thank you for the way in which you've been growing a vulnerability. And Lord, we want that to continue and grow. We don't want that to be lost as busyness resumes. So lead us in this, we pray. Lord, that we might be equipped uh, to reach others as we come to that next week. Lord, we pray all these things knowing that in the end, uh, this is not down to us, but we trust, Lord God, that as this is your vision, Lord Jesus, we trust that as you speak these words of commission to us, we also hear your promise that you'll be with us. We also know that you have given us your spirit, that we're not alone as we step out into deeper things. So Lord, excite us in this, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.